first of all, thank you all for your time uh, today. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, I understand you guys have busy schedules uh, and I appreciate you taking time your, out of your day to learn more about the Allianz Technology Trust. My name is Michael Seidenberg. I'm the lead portfolio manager on the trust. I've been associated with the trust for the past, uh, I think it's going on 14 years. Um, so I've seen uh, the trust really take on a, a life of its own, which is great um, because when I started, it was uh, relatively small. And you know we've seen just the interest in technology in the UK just continue to increase um, as I've been associated with it. <laughs> Excuse me, I had a cold last night, so bear with me just a little. Um, uh, from for just quickly on my background, next slide, please. Um, uh, next slide. Next slide. And I apologize. We had a little we had a little challenges uh, with uh, we're using Citrix at work. Um, a little bit challenging to get the presentation for me to control it, so I apologize in advance for that. But my background. Uh, is uh, I worked in technology after business school. Um, I worked for Oracle Corporation, did a variety of things for them um, and have been on the buy side in various capacities since 2001. Um, very operational, very much love technology, technology, whether that's software, semiconductors, you know, gaming, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm really passionate about the sector that I get to invest in and really consider it a privilege to get to do it. So, you know, at a high level, um, you know, what, what is our kind of philosophy that, you know, how, how do we look at technology? So we really think about technology as more of a winner's game than a loser's game, meaning that there are new segments that are created uh, within technology, you know, in, in a very short order. And if you just take a step back and just think about your own you know, kind of use of technology and how that how that may have manifested itself. I mean, just think about smartphones, right? If you roll the clock back, you know, 15 plus years ago, you know, no one had a smartphone, therefore no one had apps on their phone. Um, you know, that is a good example of a new segment created. If I look on the enterprise or what businesses, I mean, let's just think about, you know, kind of software as a service, uh, this notion of people being able to run their applications um, to do their jobs uh, without the infrastructure uh, on premise. Um, that, is, that is another example of this idea of a winner's game, um, given the kind of this rapidly changing. I think as of late, we've heard a lot of talk about artificial intelligence um, in the past you know, few uh, past, past year. And that, and that to me is another example of kind of the, why it's a winner's game. Like this is an emerging sector that is gonna have you know, billions of dollars of revenues associated with it, um, so that's what we mean by that. You know, when when we think about when we think about uh, how do we build the portfolio, we really use a, you know a mosaic, right? So we 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 look at companies, we 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 use things like grassroots resource or grassroots research, um, and we think being in the in the Silicon Valley is a real advantage to our fund and to our shareholders, uh, given that that is where a lot of these companies. Are being created and, and they innovate, and we have really good access to that. So, you know, we have a we have a long proven track record, multiple decades. We have a very consistent yet in, yet iterative investment process, really focused on stock selection, uh, primarily really focused on mid cap growth, um, and uh, we really are not, you know, we are we are benchmark aware, but not not benchmark dri driven. So you rarely ever see us have benchmark weights um, in the mega caps. And as I said, you know, proximity to, to you know, to, to these innovation hubs, which, which aren't just in the Silicon Valley, but, you know, they're, they're kind of throughout the United States, whether that's Austin, Texas, or Boston, et cetera, et cetera. We just think a lot of the innovation um, we, we have good access to. So next slide, please. So currently uh, about, you know, $1.2 billion under management, um, uh, the team collectively manages you know, north of 5 billion. It's really a team approach, um, really thinking about, you know, I interact with my team members, I have conversations with them and we'll get to the team later on, but I, I talk to them you know, throughout the day. I'm constantly uh, trying to figure out as a portfolio manager, um, you know, where is their conviction? Um, is that changing? Uh, what does that mean for position size? What do we think about valuation? Uh, with the ultimate goal 
of really under, really kind of seeking long-term capital appreciation uh, through understanding these you know new and innovative and new and inter, innovative uh, companies. I apologize. Um, and as I alluded to earlier, you know we're, we're pretty much structurally underweight mega cap. We have exposures, and you'll see in our top ten, but we're really underweight the benchmark primarily just because we think we can we can find more innovative and, and, and more uh, more interesting companies that can appreciate more in that mid cap mid cap area. Next slide, please. So here's the team, um, you know, the San Francisco technology franchise, um, which is now uh, we, were, we were acquired by Voya um, in July. So this is, this is the team. Collectively, the team manages approximately $16 billion um, as a tech team and their different you know, sub teams within that, as I alluded to ours. But you know, I work with the folks on this slide, you know, on, on a, on a kind of you know hourly basis, uh, we share meetings, we share callbacks, we we talk about stocks. I'm missing um, a meeting this morning at uh, 8 a.m. my time, um, where we kind of talk about what you know what we learned, what we're thinking, different different position sizes in the various funds, and on the far right hand side are the various strategies um, that we all collectively manage. Next slide, please. So here's the team responsible for the Allianz Technology Trust. Um, as I mentioned, I'm the lead portfolio manager. Um, I uh, implement and execute every trade that's done in the portfolio. Um, I work collaboratively with all of the folks to, um, to the right as you were facing the screen, um, Eric Swords, um, Justin Sumner, Danny Sue and Rich Gorman, and all of those particular individuals have various skill sets. Eric runs the group, so he runs all of our different products. We have a cybersecurity product. We manage some money for an insurance company. Um, so he, you know, he has kind of he kind of not only is he a portfolio manager, but he actually runs the business uh, that we're responsible for. Um, and then, depending on the individual, you know, Danny Sue, who I've worked with since I got to the firm. Um, you know, he's really responsible for semiconductors in, in Asia. Uh, Rich Gorman has really been focused on software and cybersecurity. And Justin Sumner, um, who joined us in July with, with Eric, has been focused on not only semiconductors, but does a lot of things in you know, looking, at, uh, looking at situations and whether it's China, whether it's special one-off situations around the consumer, gaming, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and we really pride ourselves on being a collaborative process. I mean, in my career, I've worked for portfolio managers that were autocratic, um, and that is not the case here. I, I really want to work collaboratively. Um, last night, for example, a Workday, which is a position in the trust, reported, and both Rich and I were on the conference call, um, you know, and we both kind of wrote, wrote notes respectively, um, and we collaborated um, with the team after, after the call. So I, I really kind of believe in almost, almost the Socratic method um, with respect to really thinking about stocks and thinking about valuation, uh, but understanding at the end of the day, you do need single point of accountability. Um, and I think that's super important um, as a portfolio manager. Um, you know, we augment um, our team, as I alluded to earlier with grassroots research um, just uh, pause. I'll pause on it for two seconds. Grassroots is an organization um, that that goes out and does survey work and interviews of the customers of the product. So, for example, you know, if I roll the clock back, you know, we had a thesis, um, you know, when the iPad came out uh, that people were going to subscribe to Netflix, which had just started its, you know, survey, just started its streaming survey streaming service. Um, so we went out and talked to people leaving. They went out and talked to people leaving Apple stores in order to better understand uh, what they were going to do uh, with the iPad. And, and we found that there was a, a, a propensity to subscribe to the Netflix streaming service, which gave us conviction in the stock uh, back in the day. You know, recently, um, um, and by the way, that's a successful example uh, because it allowed us to gross up our Netflix position, which was a really good stock for the trust. Um, uh, throughout the past kind of, you know, whatever, 10 plus, 12 plus years. Um, conversely, um, you know, it has also saved us uh, where we've been wrong 
I can think of a video game um, survey that we did thinking that, that the Electronic Arts Star Wars game was going to be successful. Um, and what we realized was, uh, you know, Call of Duty, which was made by Activision, was just taking dollars away from the sector. So, you know, it, it is a good, um, you know, it is a good, good, uh, uh, a good quiver in our arrow. Um, uh, sorry, it's a it's a good arrow in our uh, in in our in our um, hunting box or whatever bad example, but um, and we just we use it uh, we use it depending on the situation. Um, they're independent; uh, they do the work independent of us. Um, we don't get the we're not on the calls. We don't get to bias the witness any of that stuff. So um, it's just it's just another tool in our toolkit. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. So what is our investment uh, philosophy? Um, you know, as I just kind of alluded to, and as I'll allude to more, you know, it's a multi-pronged investment. Uh, uh, it's, it's a multi-pronged in, investment process, right? It's, it's, it's really you know, boots on the ground, visiting companies, listening to customer calls, listening to system integrators, going out, talking to users of products, um, and we augment that, as I alluded to, with um, grassroots. But you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. And, and those of you who know me, um, uh, you know, if you've ever, you know, if I'm in the UK, I'm constantly asking to go to Starbucks to observe people, and I want to see what products and uh, and technologies they're interacting be, interacting with, and what they're what they're using because I, I kind of have a core process that, that products that make people's lives better are products that get used. And you can roll that through to the enterprise as well. Um, uh, you know, just thinking about, you know, as we talk to system integrators, as we talk to developers, really understanding, you know, I, one of the common questions I ask, you know, a CEO, if I'm speaking with, with her or him is, uh, you know, tell me about three products uh, that you can't, you know, you couldn't operate your day-to-day -day life, you know, without um, from a business perspective. So really kind of understanding, um, you know, what are the, what are the products and tools um, that, 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 that are relevant, that are gaining traction, et cetera, et cetera. And then really trying to think through, you know, at a segment level, um, you know, how, how do, who are the leaders in these segments of the products, right? Who are the leaders in developer tools and what management team is the best team because we think that that really mitigates um, uh, uh, the blow up aspect of our job and, and that happens in, with technology companies heck it happens with all companies in the stock market but we really think by investing in the best management team that executes the best that usually ends up being the winner in that particular segment um, so we really are focused on the number one or two number number one or two players um, diversification is key. Um, we, you know, we not only diversi diversify at a segment level, we, a, a, we diversify at a style level. So if you look at the portfolio today, uh, which has a big, uh, which has a big semiconductor weighting, it's really geared to more towards, you know, specialized semiconductors, companies that we think have the best chance of having the best pricing power um, in this more difficult environment. So really thinking about diversification at a segment level, but also diversification at the style level, making sure we don't have too much exposure to a particular style in the market. Next slide, please. So the investment process, we have this universe of stocks, um, you know, idea generation that comes from, you know, attending, you know, user groups, talking to management, talking to users of products, talking to, um, you know, doing survey work. And that really points us in a, in a direction of where we can kind of go figure out who those attractive companies are, right? Who are those companies that have the, the business models that we think have long-term, um, you know, operating margins that we think are, are attractive? Look, I'll tell you candidly, um, there are times where we look at, uh, we look at a segment and we realize it's profitless prosperity, given that there are too many competitors, there are not enough margin dollars to go around and therefore um, we avoid that particular sector. And that's just part of the job. I mean, that always reminds me of my, one of my wife's favorite um, sayings is you have to kiss, kiss a lot of frogs to find a prince. And I feel like to some degree that's true of in technology investing in that you have this 
you have this big universe, you have all these ideas, yet at the end of the day, you have to have a company that's going to be profitable long term, that has barriers to entry that allow them to have that competitive advantage. Um, therefore, they can grow those cash flows um, uh, and create the value for the shareholders. So it's not just ideas that are attractive. At the end of the day, we're looking for you know, we're looking for stocks that appreciate because of their products or services are being used by people um, time and time again over a multi-year time period. Um, you know, so as we, as we identify those companies, um, we start to build our portfolio. Um, it's a diversified portfolio. It has aspects of growth um, to it. It also has, you know, valuation parameters. We'll have some high growth companies We'll have some value companies and we'll have some kind of garpy companies because we think it's important to have stylistic, uh, stylistic diversification. Um, and then kind of, you know, and then we look at from a risk management perspective, um, you know, we, 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 we are able to run reports to figure out kind of what are our biases of our portfolio construction, making sure that we, that we understand the unintended consequences we're taking with respect to portfolio construction. Um, from that is a final portfolio, a portfolio that's about 40 to 70 stocks, uh, depending on our level of conviction. Um, and, you know, this is this iterative process um, and we continue to really refine it uh, with respect to, you know, how do we identify and how do we figure out those companies? Uh, next slide, please. And as I alluded to, you know, 40 to 70 stocks were benchmarked against the Dow Jones World Technology in in Index. It's a very broad uh, index. It has a super high concentration of mega cap stocks, which at times, you know, means it's very difficult for us uh, to outperform, but we do our best to try to. Um, and, you know, we tend to be, as I said, benchmark aware, but not by, not by any means uh, benchmark driven, as you can tell, um, you know, at, at looking at our active share. Um, and uh, we have a very active board, a board um, that is very involved in our business, which is great. Um, and they're really kind of cognizant of risk control. So, you know, our max position is about 10%. Um, uh, it may go over a little on appreciation, but we would, you know, there, there's no chance that if I had stock is 10% and I say I want to buy another 2%, I think it would be a, a really difficult conversation with the board. Um, in fact, I don't think it would happen. Um, you know, from a market cap perspective, really focused on those mid cap growth companies, you know, above $2 billion market cap. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, next slide, please. So, you know, what, what is kind of my, <laughs> what is a day in the life of our portfolio? Well, look, you know, as I alluded to last night, I was on an earnings call, I'll be on an earnings call later on this afternoon. You know, we have a follow-up call um, uh, with a number of companies that uh, reported last week. Last week was really busy. So we're in this kind of, you know, constant dialogue of digesting information, going out, kind of talking to customers, user groups, system integrators, you know, chief information officers, and you know, in really dialoguing with management, right? Because our goal is to really understand what's going on with our business, you know, with the backdrop of understanding that nothing's perfect, right? Companies are always going to have challenges, um, you know, and, and what we're, we really want to understand is how does, a, how does a company kind of handle those challenges uh, from an execution perspective? Um, and, you know, and, 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 and if a company had a particularly challenging quarter, is this, you know, is it a, a thesis changing event or is it just a one-off event? Um, and that's really important. So, you know, uh, as I, you know, talking to management teams, meeting in person uh, next week, uh, we have the Morgan Stanley Conference um, here in San Francisco, um, starting on Monday, that'll run the entire week. I'll probably do, I would say, probably close to, you know, 30 meetings slash, you know, pre group presentations. Um, and then really kind of thinking about the subsector um, uh, subsector exposures that we have in the portfolio, you know, what, what feel, what is doing better at the margin, what is doing worse. And, you know, that is somewhat a function of what's happening in the economy, right? You know, uh, you know, if you look at certain sectors within technology are more defensive than others, um, as IT budgets get tightened, you know, generally speaking, uh, people continue to spend on, on different things versus maybe they had more discretionary spend 
two years ago when, when people were just trying to get everyone productive during the pandemic. Um, so just, you know, understanding subsectors and then obviously it goes without saying, really wanting to understand the competitive landscape as part of that mosaic, right? And for most of our companies, the biggest competition is not a public company that, that anyone on this call is aware of. It's a private company. So I think of it, you know, a little like the way a shark attacks, right? Sharks attack from the bottom, you know, from the bottom up. So I need to be aware of that private company that may make it very difficult for the existing public company. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, the risk, risk management is an important part of our process. Um, you know, we receive daily, daily monitoring uh, reports around risk management. I had a meeting yesterday with Eric and Justin where we went over all our various portfolios to look at various risk factors. Um, that happens once a week. Um, you know, we have monthly, monthly uh, review of risk management uh, with, with our, our chief investment officer, uh, making sure we making sure we we look at the various risks plus uh, you know making sure we're aware of the various ESG risk considerations. Luckily for most tech companies, and this is not an ESG fund, but you know for many of the tech companies are pretty uh, ESG friendly with ex with exception of obviously the shareholder uh, dual class shareholder and founders having a lot of um, uh, sh sh founders having a lot of a lot of voting rights. Uh, and then we do this, these quarterly deep dive. Uh, folks, deep, deep dive meetings with the global CIO. So, you know, risk management is an important part of our process, um, and it's not something we take for granted. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. So this is the trust over a multi-year time period. This happens to be 10 years, um, and you can see it. Um, yeah, we've had a tough year in the last year um, as some of the, you know, we, we had, we'd started pivoting away from some of the higher growth companies in uh, the summer of 21, but we didn't do it quick enough um, and resulted in uh, some you know, subpar performance uh, the past couple of years. Uh, it's not something that we're particularly proud of, but on a multi-year multi -year time frame, um, we've, we've tended to do outperform uh, uh, the benchmark that were benched again. Um, and uh, you know, I'll tell you that, I spend very little time looking at our historic performance. I really care about the here and now uh, because that's what you, the shareholder, are, are, are paying me for today. So I'm actually feeling really, uh, feeling better about the technology sector, especially as we've gone through some of the Q4 earnings um, and they haven't been as bad as feared, uh, which is good to see. Um, I continue to think that, you know, from a long-term durability perspective, technology really is the way most companies create competitive advantage. So I feel like 2023 is actually sh shaping up to be a pretty interesting year as you see companies have more fiduciary responsibility with respect to you know, making sure their costs are in line, but also really understanding that a lot of these businesses, you know, uh, last night, you know, Workday, for example, which is a human capital management software company, is talking about, you know, getting back to 20% growth uh, probably not this calendar year, but next calendar year as the environment improves. I mean, that, and they're going to do, you know, north of $6 billion. And so that's pretty impressive uh, with good operating margins. So I'm feeling better about where we stand today than, than I did six months ago, um, uh, which, you know, I start to feel, I'm starting to kind of see kind of where things are starting to shake out within technology. Um, next slide, please. So this is shows you some of our exposures. Um, you'll see, and, and I want to be really careful here. So you know, on the right hand side, you'll see our country weightings. Just to be clear, that is where the company is headquartered. That does not um, indicate um, where the revenues are. So many of the tech companies happen to be domiciled in the United States. It's a little like saying that you know, back in the day, Glaxo was domiciled in the UK, yet most of the profits came out of the US. Um, I don't want you to think we're a US centric uh, fund, we are not. Um, we try to, we are global in nature. Uh, it just so happens that a lot of the companies uh, are, are headquartered in the United States. From a portfolio perspective on the left-hand side, you'll see, um, listen to me, it's probably not surprisingly, you know, we're overweight uh, software because I think, 
the, I think software in general creates massive competitive advantages for companies that use the products. Um, we're uh, a little overweight semiconductors within semis. We're really focused on kind of more specialized semiconductor players versus commodities and some of the equipment manufacturers. So I really want companies that have exposure to things like, you know, EVs, electronic vehicles, hybrids. Um, you know, the, the, there is so much going on with specialized sem semiconductors. So I'm really focused on those companies. Um, underweight uh, media. Um, so that would be the likes of, you know, the Googles um, uh, and a uh, you know, really underweight uh, technology and hardware and have been for a long time. So, you know, that's a snapshot. We can, I can go into more detail as you'll see it as the presentation goes on, but that just kind of shows you where our exposures are um, and how we and kind of where, we, where we're making the relative uh, positioning um, sizes. Next slide, please. So this just shows you um, just some of the things we've done in the last kind of three months as of January 31st, um, you know, where, where we've added, as I alluded to, um, you know, we, you know, we, we and, I, and, I, and I use, uh, they should just put in additions in the slide. I'm gonna change that because it's, it's not very significant. But, you know, we, we, we added to, uh, you know, companies like ASML, uh, they are a, um, uh, an equipment manufacturer and the semiconductors that you handle all the lithography. Um, uh, you know, we bought, you know, we inched our way back into uh, things like, you know, some exposure to China vis-a-vis -vis Alibaba, which we hadn't had for a long time. And, and then things like, you know, Cadence System, which is a company I absolutely love, um, which is, which is, you know, um, which is building, uh, create software for chip design. And I think they have just a great, a great uh, runway in front of them. Um, uh, on the sales side, you know, we, uh, uh, I incorrectly sold booking, which just had a good quarter thinking that travel um, would kind of pull back. That's not the case. So that's an example of a mistake, uh, which I, which I'm not proud of, but happens in our business. Um, I shouldn't have sold the stock. It's, you know, incredibly well run good, you know, relatively cheap PE, given what's going on. And, you know, the consumer keeps traveling. We've taken down our exposure in some higher growth companies like Alassian, uh, which is a, a developer tool, and I just couldn't get the math to work. Um, same with the Zoom Info. Um, and just, you know, the video, the video game space um, has been a trickier one. So we sold uh, take two. So just, you know, this is just representative. I'm happy in Q&A to go back specifically to you, by all means, ask me, or whatever you want, uh, but uh, this just kind of shows you kind of how some recent changes in the portfolio. Uh, next slide, please. Great. Um, so uh, these are our top ten holdings. Um, as I alluded to earlier, um, you know we are underweight the mega caps, but still relatively large positions for us. So. You can see Apple, you know, 5.5% position, benchmark is 16%. Um, so, you know, that's indicative of kind of where, how we're feeling about Apple right now. Um, uh, we've actually, uh, that's as of January 31st, we've actually increased a little just because they have a product cycle coming up. Um, but, you know, I, I, you know a new posi uh, position where, uh, where, where we are feeling good about, which we had known for a long time was Meta. Uh, we bought it uh, late last year um, after not owning it for most of the year. Um, and uh, that's been a position that, that we think, uh, you know, the valuation is on our side. They're fixing the business. Um, and we think we have, you know, a good chance for stock appreciation there. Taiwan Semiconductor, they're the large manufacturer of semiconductors on the leading edge um, out of Taiwan. The stock um, had really gotten beaten down because of political risk. Um, so here again, you know, I'm not going to go through every one, but you'll see a variety of companies. You'll see some companies you probably have never heard of, Paycom Software, which is a mid-cap growth, uh, mid growth uh, cloud payroll company that also does, uh, you know, some employee um, HR stuff. Um, so, uh, you know, just indicative of our, this, I think the top 10 really represents, uh, you know, kind of where, where we tend to play. So you see some mid-cap growth, you see some mega cap, and you see some kind of in non-benchmark positions in the likes of a Taiwan semiconductor. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, you know, here again, 
<laughs> we tend to focus on mid cap growth. I said it a bunch. Uh, this slide shouldn't be very surprising to anyone on this uh, on the call at this point. Underweight mega cap, a little bit overweight large cap, way, well overweight uh, mid cap, and then under you know basically benchmark on small cap. Small cap is not something we spend a lot of time on. Um, you know, we just think that these mid cap growth companies, uh, if we can, if we if our process is the right one, we can identify them and really kind of ride that appreciation. Um, which at times is easier um, than others, uh, but uh, you know that's tended tended it has tended to be a philosophy that's really served us well over time. Next slide, please. Uh, Fifty six uh, holdings. Uh, you know, uh, you can see um, uh, similar earning growth the last three years, but uh, looking forward over the next three to five, we have uh, better EPS growth. Um, primarily because many of the companies we're investing in are basically making that turn to profitability. Um, so that gives us um, better EPS growth at a, at a, at a fairly minimal, um, uh, fairly minimal uh, PE, uh, more expensive PE um, in, in the bottom there, um, looking forward, um, you know, just looking at the out year EPS. So we're getting better EPS growth. We're paying a little bit of a premium, and that makes me uh, feel good uh, about kind of the way we're positioned. Um, look, I think you know a core philosophy of mine and my predecessor and everyone on the team is that higher growth companies deserve higher PEs, um, and that's something that uh, that that we see in technology over time. So we try to figure out those companies that are going to be those higher growth companies um, that have sustaining or sustained earnings growth. Um, or we look for, you know, value plays uh, where companies are basically going to return cash to shareholders vis-a-vis -vis restructurings, vis-a-vis -vis dividends, buybacks. So really thinking about those barbells, um, uh, if you will. Next slide, please. So what are the drivers of growth uh, of technology? And we'll, we'll pick up the pace here because I want to get to the we want to get to some of the examples. So you leave here understanding why, what we're excited about, you know. Technology is a, is a fairly uh, large sector now of the economy. So you have high growth companies, you have GARPI companies, and you have a, you know kind of value companies. And those companies tend to follow a life cycle. So um, you know when companies are growing quickly, they're not as profitable. They tend to overinvest in distribution. As they mature, they become more. For, they, they they have the ability to return some of that cash vis a vis margin expansion and earnings growth. Um, and as they are super mature, they're able to basically, uh, you know, create dividends, stock buybacks, et cetera. So that's just going down that continuum. Um, so we look at all of these different sectors. We really think about, you know, how do we make sure in this kind of three tiered cake that we have exposure to each of those various groups. And depending on how we feel about the overall environment, we may have more exposure to high growth companies. We may have more exposure to GARP companies, or we may have more exposure to value. Uh, we think it's important. I would even in you know the back half of 2020, where we could have had 100% of the portfolio in high growth companies. Um, you know, we would have never done that. We really think about risk control. We really think about making sure that that the portfolio ha has 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 is does not have too much style risk, um, because that creates a lot of volatility, which we don't want. Next slide, please. This is showing us just the relative PE um, of, of, the, uh, of the IT sector versus the S&P 500. And you'll see that, you know, technology, you know, I lived through the dot-com. Um, that was not particularly fun um, as an employee. And I think that, the, 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 you know, the, that shipping bricks across the internet is a really bad idea. I don't care if you use an internet browser or not. And companies had like, you know, kind of stupid valuations back then. I know it was a long time ago, but I think this just shows you the relevance of tech in the overall sector uh, because today the valuations are much more reasonable. Um, and these, these, these companies are key ingredients um, to the world we live in. Uh, so it has a modest premium, the S&P 500, which I think is warranted. Um, uh, next slide, please. So this is an example of kind of a more recent example of kind of where we are in software and why 
I have the overweight that we do, or why we have the overweight. Look, you know, during the pandemic, uh, valuations got uh, pretty crazy. Um, uh, obviously, the companies are growing, but people assigned really high multiples. And today, we're looking at a multiple that's really indicative of kind of, you know, going back to, um, you know, kind of where things were in, the, in 2017. And I would make the argument that the software companies that we're investing in are much more relevant to their customers than they were in 2017, i.e. the customer is much more dependent on this particular subsector. Um, and therefore, when I look at the valuation, I think it's very attractive on a multi-year basis. Um, I think it's something that, uh, it, that is gonna basically afford us an opportunity. This, this, this time period is gonna afford us you know, the ability to own some of these companies that really have excellent multi-year growth characteristics. So that's kind of why we're overweight software. Um, if I look at the valuation, next slide, please. So what gets us excited or what, you know, what are some interesting things that are happening? Um, you know, you know, cloud computing uh, is, continues to be a huge driver of spin uh, in the industry. Um, you know, you've heard a lot about artificial intelligence um, and that's really become top of mind. You know, it's difficult to play from a pure play perspective. So you want to own the food chain. You want to own, you know, things like NVIDIA, um, potentially things, you know, things like um, potentially Arista Networks, which is a company that's going to facilitate moving that data. Um, artificial intelligence requires a tremendous amount of data to be moved around the data center. Um, cybersecurity, which to me is just, you know, arguably the best neighborhood in all of technology, um, given the threats, given that it's become, you know, nation states now trying to, you know, steal, you know, steal state secrets from one another. It's no longer, you know, 10 guys in a room trying to hack into a, into a corner store. These are really well-funded government organizations and they require every company to spend aggressively on cybersecurity. I think that that is, that is one of the best sectors on a multi-year ba basis. Um, uh, in uh, technology, you know, I, I alluded to this earlier, but the, uh, the, the electrification of vehicles, it'll end up being construction equipment, it'll end up being power tools, et cetera, et cetera. That is just a really interesting space to be. I think last year in the US, I read that I think 6% of all cars sold are now EVs, which is just a kind of out of nowhere um, it, uh, that, that, that has emerged. Um, obviously we own Tesla, um, it, it's, a, it's a fairly sizable position for us. Um, and then the internet of things, this kind of notion that everything is connected um, uh, and we're living in this world where people, you know, can, uh, can you know, basically pull that off of any device, any, anything um, to, to facilitate making better decisions. So that's what we're, those are some things we're excited about. Next slide, please. I'm gonna go through these quickly. I know we have Q and A. This just kind of shows you the cloud spending, which I alluded to in the earlier in the earlier uh, in the earlier slide. You know, we're still fairly nascent. Um, next slide, please. Uh, you know, just just the progression. You know, I live through client server of uh, kind of what's happening in technology as we as we move through time. You know, now we've gone from you know kind of big data to artificial intelligence, this ability. Um, to have this kind of ideal model for a particular thing and then you know refinement of that model vis-a-vis -vis improving the algorithms and that's what you know, artificial intelligence is it just requires a ton of compute and um, a ton of compute and storage power uh, next slide I, I alluded to this but you know cybersecurity you know 12.6 percent growth rate um, until 2030, 2030, you just don't see those types of things very often um, in technology. And it's just top of mind, whether, whether you're uh, a CEO, whether a consumer, et cetera, et cetera, we're all very aware of cybersecurity and what it means to our daily lives and how impactful it can be if you're breached. Next slide, please. Electronic vehicles, just kind of showing us the amount of semiconductor content um, that is going in uh, to the various EV or various cars as they progress along the electrification path. Um, you know, uh, as I mentioned, you know, just more and more pure play EVs, you know, be, being part of, um, uh, part of uh, the buying decision. Next slide. 
and just, you know, the use of data. I mean, this just kind of goes without saying, you know, the, the, the good thing is our lives are very digital. Therefore, you know, our, the customers and the businesses we want to do service with uh, need to make sure that they can do, do business with us on our, on our terms and conditions. And that is really a digital, uh, that really requires lots of data being used um, uh, in meeting the customer where they want to be met. Next slide, please. I think this is really interesting. There's been a lot, a lot of stuff written about this, and I'll go through it fairly quickly. But you know, every country, every uh, first world country has talked about you know the labor shortage. This was existed prior to the pandemic. It's just been exacerbated after the pandemic. And you know, we're we're living in a world where a lot of first world countries have labor shortages. So what happens? Like, how do you solve that problem? To get, you know, when you when you have a labor shortage, and the next slide will show you. Um, Next slide, please. So we have this forecasted labor shortage, um, you know, globally and traditionally. If you go to the next slide, um, traditionally technology has kind of come in and 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 solve those problems. Um, so you can see on this slide that technology comes in and makes people more effective and or more productive, and that's really interesting because uh, I think that you're going to see. Uh, people continue to spend a high percentage of GDP um, uh, on technology because they can't get the they can't get the people needed. So um, I think that you know I think it's a great slide to end on. I apologize if I went over a few minutes, um, but uh, I'm happy to take Q and A at this point. Thanks very much, Michael, for a very interesting. Uh, Sorry, I went over a couple. <laughs> no problems. Um, so we've, we've got a couple of questions so far. I remind people if anyone else wants to ask a question, sure. click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and uh, type in your, your question. So kick off, first of all, with a question from Ian. Um, do you think operating margins are possibly under pressure over the next year if inflationary pressures persist longer term? It's a good question. Look I think that you know the ability to pass, the companies have, will have some ability to pass on uh, price pricing to their customers. I think specifically for the technology companies, is you've seen just a real willingness to look at their cost structures and adjust accordingly. And we didn't see that, um, or we haven't seen that in the past couple of years. So I think for tech at the margin, they are more focused on expanding, not contracting their operating margins primarily because they've been in such an investment spend mode um, during, you know, prior to the pandemic and during the pandemic. So I do think tech is a bit, a bit of a different animal um, in this particular instance, primarily because they just were spending so aggressively. And even last night uh, on Workday's quarter, uh, where they had a good quarter, they still talked about becoming more, um, more operationally efficient uh, you know, as, as, as their business returns to growth. So they're not talking about spending again, they're talking about really maintaining and being more, more, more fiduciary responsible. So I don't, I, I, I don't worry about this as much on the tech front as I do about other sectors, right? Um, you know, I, I love to cook um, and I'm just shocked when I go to grocery stores. I'm just blown away by the prices of items. I mean, um, and, you know, uh, I, I think that there you've seen, you know, re inflation really, really kind of show its ugly face. Thanks, Michael. Um, next question is, what are the interest rate assumptions you're using to value companies over the next three to five years, i.e. the risk-free rate? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, we're pretty, I'd love to tell you that I, I understand uh, kind of where interest rates are going. Um, that's not kind of my day job, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're just assuming the current interest, current interest rates as we, in our models, um, which, you know, you know, I think we're plus or minus a couple on it. Um, you know, here again, you know, we're fundamental investors um, with a macro overview. So, you know, it's not a particularly great use of my skill set to spend a whole lot of time thinking about where interest rates are going. Look, I think there's a, there's a very cognizant effort to bring down inflation globally. So that gives me hope um, that, you know, that, that today's rates are, are fairly realistic. Um, 
you know, uh, th that tends to be the way we've operated. Uh, we've never really g gone out, you know, in, in, in my history at the trust, we never really spent lots of time uh, trying to figure out, you know, what the right interest, what the interest rates are going to be. Thanks. Uh, I'll just supplement that question. Uh, there was a slide where you showed how valuation multiples had changed. Yep. Uh, was that referring to revenue multiples or? Yes, it was. Because I, I thought it was. Yes. Soft, software revenue multiples. So you saw, yeah. you know, in 2013, 2017, that time period, we're basically back there, um, mm -hmm. which is why I'm optimistic, cautiously optimistic on software companies. Because, you know, if you think about, you know, most of the businesses you interact with, their dependency on software, you know, in 2023 compared to 2020, 17 is very different. I mean, you think about, just think about, you know, trying to do, do a return today, right? You can basically, you just have to call a call center or get a, a return act, a return authorization, et cetera, et cetera. Now you go on a website, right? You put in your name, address, you put in this, you know, SKU number, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's, that's software in action. I just think we're living in a world um, that where software just becomes even more relevant. And, and I think that at the end of the presentation, I talked about it, just this idea of labor shortage. I mean, you know, in the US, there are just so many job openings um, because we just can't get, you know, we can't get people kind of back to, we can't get people back into the labor pool is the bottom line. Mm. I think it's the same in the UK. I mean, I go there yeah. enough to know, you know, hours get changed on stores, you know, you know, whatever, you wait longer for your baggage, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, there's def definitely a, a shortage of labor. But again, just for the information of the of the audience, um, most of the, the software companies that you'd be investing in have rec strong recurring revenues. 100%. So those sort of companies tend to be valued on, on revenue multiples rather than, than doing a, a DCF model of them. Which yeah, where, it, where that in. changes, Mark, is a great point. Where it changes is as they make that turn. So listen, you know, the subscription model from an accounting perspective is you incur that cost in a given time period, 100% of it, yet you only recognize a sliver of that revenue, right? Which means that mm. that's a loss. Um, what happens over time is as companies mature, they really start to generate cash flows, right? Because the model kind of turns, it turns the other way. So many mm. of the companies um, as were referenced on that particular slide are, are, are going to be, will be cash flow positive in the next couple of years. I mean, they're probably modestly cash flow positive today, but they really start to hit their stride uh, as you hit that customer renewal um, on kind of year two, you know, that second renewal. And as they have enough of those occurring to kind of offset the, the cost. But, you know, the subscription model um, really penalizes companies from an accounting perspective. Um, because you just you, you you only you take a conservative approach from an accounting perspective, which is you only recognize you know revenue for the time for the time period. Thanks. Okay, uh, a couple more questions here. Um, Simon comments: portfolio turnover seems high at the moment. Why is that, and do you expect it to change over the next six to twelve months? Yeah, it's a fair point. It has been higher than normal. Look, we've we, we've been in a really volatile market the past uh, you know year, so we've been trying to you know position accordingly. Um, I'd say a lot of that turnover are trims and names. Um, uh, it also is worth noting that I took over the portfolio um, as of July first, so I obviously made some changes um, to the portfolio from uh, from from a stock perspective. Um, as the new PM, um, so that artificially, you know, that's not an everyday occurrence, or hopefully it's not an everyday occurrence that we have a new, new lead portfolio manager. Um, uh, so yeah, it is a little bit high. I'd, I would like to bring it down um, over the next kind of, you know, six to 12. Um, so, but I do think, you're, you know, it's been a, you know, there've been all kinds of articles just talking about how volatile markets are. So, you know, we've been, we've been kind of making true, you know, modest changes here and there as we get our chance, uh, as we see opportunities uh, to kind of put away some profits. Thanks. Okay. Um, David comments, uh, my investment in this trust is down 28% uh, 
uh, held steady for some time. Uh, when can I hope for it, given your changes in the portfolio, to begin to move upwards? <laughs> well, as long as the, yeah, first, yeah. <laughs> first of all, um, you know, thank you for investing in the trust. Um, you know, as I as I point to, um, you know, if you look at our long term record, uh, we've done it. You know, we, we've created value for our shareholders. Um, you know, near term, it's been more challenging. Um, you know, hopefully, the, the, you know, the, this year we're off to an okay start on, from a, from a positive perspective. Um, but you know, be be patient. Uh, you know, I don't think there's anything that that changes my core philosophy um, that this is a type of product that create shareholder value um, over a multi-year time period. So yeah, appreciate your patience. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, then Ray uh, is sort of elaborating on what we referred to uh, previously and asking how much consideration you give to, to annual recurring revenue in valuing software companies. Yeah, yeah we kind of hit on this, but it's a great question, Ray. It, yeah. It's such an important, it, look, it, you know, the, I'm trying to think if any of our any of our companies in the portfolio aren't on a subscription. I don't think anything is left. Maybe Aspen Tech AZPN has a bit of perpetual still in their model, but it's just the way the future look. It's it really aligns the interests of the company and the buyer in that you know if I sell something to Ray in this example, um, uh, you know, uh, and he does it. You know, and I worked at Oracle where we would you know back in the uh, back in the late 90s where we would slam a bunch of licensed software in there and then run away and never try to talk to the customer <laughs> for a long time. I do think that this I do think that the subscription model really aligns the interests because if you're not happy, you the customer, you can opt not to renew um, that that one year term or you know most companies sign you know two to three year terms. but let's just say you sign a one year term, and I do a bad job on my part um, of delivering you a good software product that meets your needs. You know, you can opt to uh, you can opt to go buy to, to move away. So you haven't sunk all this money into the product. Now it's probably not as easy as we uh, like to describe as leaving. Uh, you know, to change software products. But I can tell you one thing: it's not nearly as difficult as it was um, when I worked at Oracle. When once you bought something. You know, it wasn't just the license that was the cost, right? It was the server, it was the storage, it was all, all of those, all of that basic infrastructure today is being handled by other people. So your your switching costs really are much lower. Therefore, I think the overall customer sat uh, customer satisfaction ratio of the of the software industry has gone up, and it's why I mean I've never proven this, but I honestly think if you could go out if you bought a portfolio of, of, of software companies with the happiest customers, you would probably do okay um, relative yeah. to a benchmark because the industry had been just, you know, the reputation had been so bad for decades and now companies are really focused. I mean, I think a classic example of that is Workday last night where they literally talk about their net promoter score and it's such a source of pride, but you know, happy customers buy more and happy customers yeah give you the right to sell them more also. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we've got a couple of more minutes and there's, there's a bunch of questions I'd last to ask. A very quick one, first of all, are you constrained to invest in, in public companies only? Yeah, or we all, today we only invest in listed companies. So public equities only, although as part of our mosaic, we really make sure that we are very familiar and meet with private companies um, so that's part of our process, uh, which, you know, at the margin helps us when those companies go public, um, you know, from, from, a, from an access perspective and from an allocation perspective. But, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, we're living in a world where, you know, you know, the allocations to IPOs go to, you know, the hedge funds that trade all the time. So, you know, mm -hmm. I just like, you know, it's very important to know who, who the players are on the field. Uh, so we can do our proper due diligence and make sure that our thesis, as we're back testing our, hypo our hypothesis, that, that, that we know kind of who we should be looking at. Thanks. Uh, and then uh, another area that's very interesting at the moment, there's been a lot of focus recently 
on advances in AI and chat GPT has, yep. has featured prominently. Now, AI has been evolving a lot for a very long time. I mean, for, for many years, speech recognition, for example, was a big challenge, but now got devices yep. like Alexa and so on, it, it's working really well. With um, open AI, do you feel there's a step change in, in that uh, sector? Or, or is, is it, it more of an evolution? And, and what do you well, think I the impact like of this is going to be? A step, step change from an investor, percep investor perception. I think that, you know, um, and I did a bunch of reading on this. I was on holiday and, you know, I ran into a young, young person who was majoring in AI at a university. And I said, you know, can you just give me some, you know, papers to read just so I can have a rudimentary understanding of the journey which you're, which you're alluding to? Um, uh, I don't feel like, I feel like there's a step change with respect to optimizing the models associated with the AI. So I think that's where the step change is. And that's why people are so excited, right? In that, to your point, the, 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 the nodes on the network of the model have, people have known what those nodes are, improving or optimizing in order to, to get the, the the current system to look exactly like the model that that has improved as of late. Now the question is is you know what does that mean in practicality? Um, you know I continue to think that AI will be most efficient and effective for you know solving business problems. Right? It's mm -hmm. going to be less. I mean, ChatGPT is great, and my daughter who's a freshman <laughs> in high school, you know. We, we were playing around with it the other night. And we said, you know, write, you know, do dogs dream? Uh, give, can we have a two page paragraph on do dogs dream? And it was amazing what came out um, <laughs> from that. But I think that, you know, that's not particularly monetizable. Um, and, and I guess dogs do dream at the margin. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, I think where it becomes much more interesting is solving some of these business problems, which just require a tremendous amount of, you know, data center capacity, chip capacity, equipment capacity, you know, that's where it becomes pretty interesting from my perspective. Well, thanks very much for that, uh, Michael. We, we're pretty much um, at the end of our, our, our time now. It's been a, a very interesting Well, it's good to see you, Mark. Yeah. And you, and uh, wish you all the best with, with, your, um, with your company. Thanks, thanks for everyone's time. Have a great day.